Okay, welcome everyone. My name is Karina Bennett and I'm the Executive Director of Surface Design Association, a membership nonprofit focused on contemporary fiber and textile arts. I'm so delighted to welcome you to this week's textile talk, Mushroom Color Atlas, a chromatic universe of fungi with Julie Beeler. Each week, textile talks are brought to you by the International Quilt Museum, Modern Quilt Guild, Quilt Alliance, San Jose Museum of Quilts and Textiles, Studio Art Quilt Associates, and Surface Design Association. Before we start today, a few quick housekeeping announcements. This is a webinar, so as an audience member, your screens and mics are not showing. We welcome questions, which we will get to at the end of Julie's presentation. Uh, you can submit those at any time in the Q&A box, which is on the bottom of your screen. Feel free to use the chat box to greet others or add comments. Uh, you can drop a note right now and let us know where you're joining us from today. We do ask you to be courteous as you engage with speakers, moderators, and other participants. Your chat comments can be seen by everyone. This webinar series would not be possible without the generous support of our sponsors, Moda Fabrics and Supplies, Quilting Daily, Tourville Family, eQuilter.com, Aurafil, Artistic Artifacts, Clover, Empty Spool Seminars, Misty Fuse, Nine Patch Fabrics, Quilt Mania, Schiffer Publishing, Thai Silks, and TheQuiltShow.com. Thank you so much to these sponsors who make this series free and accessible to audiences worldwide. Today, we are so delighted to bring you Mushroom Color Atlas, A Chromatic Universe of Fungi with Julie Beeler. Julie will lead us as we discover the diverse range of colors derived from the fungi kingdom. We'll hear about her process, learn how to forage and identify dye mushrooms, and discover how to transform the colors into dyes, pigments, pinks, and inks. Julie Beeler is a designer, artist, and educator living at the base of a volcano in Trout Lake, Washington. Growing up with a deep love and curiosity of the natural world, she conceived of and launched Bloom and Dye, along with Mushroom Color Atlas to grow her work and passion to benefit what she values most. Curiosity, education, creativity, collaboration, community, and the environment. Her textile work is bound up in the landscape, drawing on cultural traditions and ancient natural dye histories. Each textile object is a record of a place and time reflecting on our relationship to the natural world. Julie served on the faculty at Pacific Northwest College of Art and Oregon College of Art and Craft in Portland, and is currently a teacher at Wildcraft Studio School in Portland, Oregon. When she was not out foraging, you can find her tending to her flower farm, working in her art studio, or leading workshops. Welcome, Julie. Thank you. I'm so excited to be here today and thank you everyone for joining. I'm seeing people coming in from all over the world. I even see people from my hometown. So thank you. And thank you, SDA, for this amazing opportunity to present and to SAQA for hosting it. I am going to get started and share my screen here. I'm going to get this going in full screen. Um, I wanted to go ahead and start us off with a quote from Ursula Le Guin, who I was really lucky um, to have live in my neighborhood and be part of my community and where I grew up in Portland. And I love this idea of thinking about to use the world well, to be able to stop wasting it and our time in it. We need to relearn our being in it. And I think that couldn't be more important now as we face the challenges and the climate crisis and connecting to nature and ultimately uh, understanding our relationship with it so we become better land stewards and uh, better stewards of our environment. So um, quickly a little background on me, my mushroom dye journey. I uh, was really lucky to grow up in the Pacific Northwest and get to explore the Cascade Mountains as a kid. And I was always curious about what was growing in the forest and you know, the mushrooms just fascinated my curiosity. And I spent a lot of time hiking and photographing, but it was a trip I took uh, with my husband to the Tetons. And we were there um, in mid-September and the mushrooms were just flourishing. And I felt like I was being led down this yellow brick road. And I thought once and for all, I've had this dream 
to learn how to identify mushrooms and learn more about mycology. And when I get home, that's the first thing I'm doing. So I signed up at the Oregon Mycological Society. I signed up for their um, ID classes and all sorts of things. And while I was going on this journey, I knew I also wanted to kind of shift my textile work. I had always been working with uh, quilts and doing crafts, textile crafts and stuff because my grandmother owned a fabric and yarn store. So it was a big part. And I thought, I wonder if mushrooms make color and put that into a Google search and voila. Uh, here it was learning all about Miriam Rice, which I'll talk about in a moment. But I was taking this uh, natural dye journey and bringing my mushrooms into it at um, the Oregon College of Art and Craft. Here you can see I'm bringing mushrooms into my studio and I'm really trying to start to understand them, organize them by type, identify them, working on my dyes. Um, oh, hey, Julie. I became part of... Sorry yes. to interrupt, this is Karina. I think that um, we're not seeing your full presentation. We just have the image of your um, the color atlas up. It's not advancing, okay. It is advancing for me. All those tests. All right, there we, we go. I and saw here it it's a second not... ago. <laughs> Thanks, folks. It'll be just a second. Sorry about this. We did lots of um, work ahead of time to make sure it all advanced just fine. And now it doesn't want to. And Julie's images are so beautiful. I wouldn't want folks to mix them. I'll can you, you see know. this quote from Ursula Le Guin? I can only see the first screen. I'm still just seeing your atlas. Oh, no. Can you see the screen now if I click this way? The, um, yes, but it's cut off. Cut off, right. It's not in full screen mode. Hmm. And of course, I don't know how. Nothing has changed. If I hit, do you see pictures I of me see, in the yes. forest? I see you in the forest. Do you see another picture of me in the forest? No. Okay. It's the same image. Thanks for your patience, everyone. This is um, will be well worth the wait because, again, these are really oh, beautiful. I'm so sorry. I'm wondering. Um, Does anyone have any ideas? Because it worked yeah. fine in all of our uh, tests that we did in advance. No problem. Yeah, I haven't encountered this particular issue, but you know, Zoom is always fun like that. Um, something new. I'm wondering if. Um, Can you guys see it uh, better now if I just went through it this way? I think or, so, or shall we of... use the backup that we have? Um, you can if you want. I don't know why it wouldn't work in full screen mode. So you don't see screens. It's still just the same. I can see the full screen. I'm just not seeing it uh, advance. I will stop sharing. I have no idea why it's doing that. Do you want me to? Um, Lucy. So your Astrid, Astrid's going to share it from her screen. So I think we're good to go there. Um, okay. Just give her one moment. Thanks, everyone. Sorry, everyone. We did a test run through yesterday, and it worked great. And even this morning before you all joined, it worked great. So yeah. I don't know what. And Julie's a pro at this, that. so um, not her first rodeo. But, <laughs> Clearly, you know. I'm not. If it's not advancing, I don't know what happened. Okay. okay. So um, you'll just let Astrid so, know as you want to advance. Yeah, if we can continue, we can advance on through here and Ursula's quote. And that's not moving either. Are you moving the screen, Astrid, to go to the next one? Um, just a second. I think we might have something wrong with the Zoom thing because that's just a PDF and it should. And sharing a screen, go to advance. Oh. 
Are you seeing it now? Mm hmm Okay. That's my keynote. And now? I think we're good. Okay. Okay. Thank you. So I talked about my mushroom journey. I also have uh, a career in interactive media. So I had uh, worked with museums and cultural institutions doing all kinds of um, collection databases. So this sort of thing inspired the Mushroom Color Atlas to get published online. Um, I worked for the Smithsonian and the National Archives and even for the International Quilt Museum. We go to the next one now. So that takes me to today where I live in Trout Lake, Washington at the base of Mount Adams. Um, the land where I live in the place where I call home stands on the Yakima uh, lands of the Yakima Nation and the, their ancestors have been here since time memorial. And I'm very lucky because I have a national forest right behind me in my backyard. Let's go to the next one. And in addition to all the work I do with mushrooms, I have a flower farm, Bloom and Die, along the White Salmon River. We can go to the next one here. We can just blow through these quick. I uh, provide uh, specialty cut flowers for um, bouquets and then also natural dyes. Um, if we want to go to the next one. Um, I harvest, dry, and package all the natural dyes online and sell them and they're available and we can go to the next screen. These dyes are made for um, color and pigments and prints and we can go to the next one. <laughs> I also um, teach workshops uh, at my studio and at uh, other locations and here are some textile pieces where I incorporate everything that I'm foraging and all the natural dyes that I grow. So we can go to the next. Um, so as we get into the mushrooms, I wanted to start with a quote from Merlin Sheldrake. And if you haven't all had the opportunity um, to read Merlin's book, Entangled Life, I highly recommend it. Um, this quote, today more than 90% of the plant species depend on mycorrhizal fungi. And the, that is fungus that has this uh, symbiotic mycorrhizal relationship. And as he says, they're the rule, not the exception. It's a more fundamental part of planthood than fruit, flowers, leaves, wood, or even roots. And as he continues on, he talks about this intimate uh, partnership. It's complete with competition and conflict and cooperation. And the plants and the fungi enact a collective flourishing. And that kind of underpins our past, our present, and our future. And I love that he says, we are unthinking without them yet seldom do we think about them. And this cost of the neglect has never been more apparent. It's an attitude we can't afford to sustain. And I think that's just so true of thinking about um, the fungi and the mycorrhizal relationships that are out there. So we can advance to the next screen. Um, there's a history of fungi for dying. And uh, Dominique Cardone's done some research into this and published this in her book, Natural Dyes, um, that in the middle of the 15th century, in the Middle Ages, there was a common element that they were using to um, achieve the crimson colors that are coming from the insect dye kermes. And they saw this reference to popo or opopo, um, which was referred to as a garrico or a garrick. A garrick is a, a type of mushroom, a species of mushrooms. And you can see here, we have Larsophomus officinalis, and that is a garricon. And they were using a garricon back then as a mordant to mordant fibers and to brighten these crimson colors. As, uh, it's, so it's pretty fascinating. Uh, this was also in the Goblin's Dye Works in Paris. They had reference to it in the 1660s and then also in Dutch manuscripts in um, 1631. 
And then here next to it, we have Fomos fomentarius, the tinder fungus or the hoof fungus. And this is a type of mushroom that's a polypore. And um, polypores were used for dyes, um, not only in North America, but in, in Europe, sorry, they were in North Africa, Central Asia, and also here in uh, Northwest North America. And these polypores would range in colors from reds to yellows to purples. Uh, this particular mushroom uh, produced different shades of yellow. Um, and this mushroom is really special because it has an inner core, this inner velvet that is referred to as amadou. And that was used um, back in like in Transylvania, it would be turned into a felt to make hats, but that was also used to put on wounds, to heal bleeding. And it was also um, used like to make wicks for tinder boxes. So hence the name tinder fungus. Um, we can go to the next screen um, because here is the mulberry polypore. So these polypores were actually recently, um, up until recently used to make dyes in the Taklaman Desert. And we think about that desert in China and the oasis is throughout that area all along um, the Silk Road. And it's kind of interesting that these oasis were spread out along the Silk Road where these mushrooms were fruiting. And uh, Dominique thinks about that as not only for trade, but also for the transmission of knowledge to, to learn about using mushrooms for dyes. And then finally, we have a Conodontium tinctorium, which is near and dear to my heart. It's the Indian paint fungus. It grows here in my area. Um, I simply refer to it as ET because I grew up in the time frame of the movie ET. Um, but this Mushroom was used by indigenous peoples on the west coast of North America. It's the source of the bright red uh, body paint. And that wasn't just for aesthetic and symbolic purposes. It was also um, to protect the skin from insect bites and from sunburns, and would also help reduce glare um, and kind of reduce that chance of snow blindness. And if you dye with this mushroom, it can create some orangish, pinkish, purplish colors. So that's a little history on uh, the use of mushroom dyes throughout time. We can go to the next screen. And this is Miriam Rice. And remember I mentioned that I uh, did that Google search and found that mushrooms do make color. And I came across Miriam Rice and the work that she had done. Um, this was back in 1968. Miriam was an artist and an educator, and she was teaching young kids about natural dyes at the Mendocino Arts Center. And some friends in the community asked her to go on a uh, foray for mushrooms. And that piqued her curiosity. And she scooped up um, a bunch of sulfur tufts, and she put them in, into a dye pot, and voila, a beautiful lemony yellow came out. And so Miriam started this kind of research and experimentation with mushrooms. And she had some colleagues, um, Eric and Carla Sundstrom over in Sweden, and they were continuing to advance their research and do these studies. And if we go to the next page, you can see the book that she published. Oh, that missed a page. Oh, we can stay back on Miriam, sorry. Um, Miriam published a book called Mushrooms for Color. And that book and the work that she did there continued then into the 80s. And she published a new book, um, Mushrooms for Dyes, Pigments, and Mycosticks. I can't remember the full name here without seeing it on the screen. Um, and that is the book I came across. That book had recently been republished by uh, Fungi Perfecti, the company that Paul Stamets has. And um, I got that book. I immediately went down the rabbit hole. I started cooking dye mushrooms in my kitchen and smelling up my whole house. And um, then I learned about another book a couple of years later, uh, The Rainbow Beneath My Feet, which is an amazing uh, mushroom dye field guide. And it was written by Arlene and Alan Bassetti. And between those books, I really was able uh, to learn about mushroom dyes and explore them in conjunction with my mycological society. Um, Miriam founded the uh, 
International Mushroom Dye Institute. And that nonprofit is still run today by her daughter, Felicia Rice. And Miriam also founded uh, the International Fungi and Fiber Symposium. And this idea of bringing people together every few years from around the world to advance the study and research into mushrooms for color. Okay, so we can stop the screen share and I am going to try to uh, see if this works. I was gonna show the mushroom color atlas. Um, can everyone, I'm hoping you can see the mushroom color atlas. Um, as it loads in. If you haven't had a chance to look at it, uh, you can go through the mushroom color atlas by color. And as you move through, it highlights the mushroom. Um, you can select one and go in and zoom into the colors and textures. I've got things organized by the different types of fibers, the different mordants that I'm using. You can zoom in and see Yuli's amazing illustrations. I've got all the information about my dye preparation. I've even got some batch notes in here. And then I also have an area called Mycopeeps, um, the community of people that I've worked with, mycologists, mycophiles, on these uh, forays and forages and stuff for these mushrooms. And you can go up and you can also select by mushroom itself. Um, this is Cortinarius neosanguinus. The reason I show that is it's this is mushroom makes these beautiful reds, um, but you can see I've done different studies and you get different colors from different mushrooms based on different treatments that you do in shifting the dye baths. Um, and then if you want, you can actually filter um, the colors here. If you want to see, you know, tooth fungus, what colors do they make? You can see those palettes, or if you just want to see the dyes from the fabric versus the pigments. You can go through and you can look specifically at wool and all sorts of things. And you are also able to go through it by index, um, looking at mushrooms organized by type. And this is a really great way if you're just learning about mushrooms to start to understand the different types of mushrooms that are out there and then be able to work with the mycological keys to um, key out a specific mushroom. So I'm gonna stop sharing that. I'm gonna go back and try to share my presentation. We'll see if this works. So I have a quote here um, from Jonathan Rieke. He's the director of the Somerset House. And this really resonated with me. I saw this after I had created the Mushroom Color Atlas. And he talks about that mushrooms may be rooted in history, but our interaction with them is about channeling human creativity in new and unexpected ways. And I think that's happening throughout the mycological world with the advancement of the different sciences in getting things uh, out there to the public and more mainstream about edibles and medicinals and all sorts of things. Um, but really the, the Mushroom Color Atlas is there so that we can think creatively about our interaction with the fungi kingdom and what, how can that channel interesting and new ways to work with them? Okay, I'm gonna try to advance. I don't know, can any, can I someone am, hop on and tell me if they I see that? I am not seeing an advance, Julie. Okay, so um, I'll stop the share. Astrid, do you mind pulling up the file? I'm so sorry this didn't work. I don't know what could have gone wrong. Everything was exactly the same. <laughs> um, okay, so we can advance to the next screen. Um, so now that you've seen the Mushroom Color Atlas, these are some behind the scenes look at how to create it. When I was conceiving of this, I was thinking about um, the content and the experience. And I was working up these wireframes, these black and white line drawings. And then my husband, actually um, did the visual design of the Mushroom Color Atlas, which I'm so lucky because he's an incredibly talented designer. And he was starting to think about the typography and the color and how all this information could get presented on screen. And 
as we were thinking about this, we were thinking about the mushrooms themselves. And if you want to go to the next screen, you can see we were considering different, uh, you know, do we use photographs? Do we use um, illustrations that are full color? What do we do? And we really settled on having black and white illustrations so that the palettes and the colors from the mushrooms could be the star of the experience. So I went to Instagram and I met Yuli Gates, who was doing this beautiful work. You can see her woodblock cut of edible mushrooms there on the side. And I saw this and I connected with Yuli. She lives in the UK and she was in um, the healthcare field. And so she was you know, thrown into the worst of the worst of COVID. And we were talking about all that that was happening. And she said, I would love to do this project. I work really long shifts and then I get a few days off and nothing would be more wonderful than to, to draw these mushrooms. So Yuli spent uh, a lot of time and energy creating these beautiful illustrations. We can go to the next screen. So here we are looking at mushrooms and the, image uh, on the side is from my friend Rachel Zoller, who lives here in my community. And I've done lots of foraging with Rachel. And when we think of a mushroom, this is the quintessential image that we all think of, right? It's this mushroom with this cap, with these gills. It's got some kind of stipe or stem or stalk. Some may have a cute little ring or skirt around it. And they're always coming up out of this kind of sack or vulva up from the dirt. And they all have mycelium that's connecting them all. And that mycelium is the roots. It's the roots of the fungi. It's what has that connection with the plants and the trees and everything in the environment. And when you look at Yuli's illustrations here, you notice that very few dye mushrooms actually look like our quintessential mushroom. And that's something that's really important so that as you begin to identify mushrooms, you start to learn what type of mushroom is it? What what general type is it and what does it live in? And we can advance to the next screen. Um, this is uh, a bolete. So a bolete is a type of uh, mushroom and it has a sponge underneath its cap rather than gills. And this is our spring king here in our area. It's also known as a porcini and uh, creates a beautiful range of colors. We can go to the next screen. And then there's a type of um, fungi called coral fungi. And it truly looks like the coral that you see images of, you know, in the depths of the ocean. It's just a gorgeous, gorgeous mushroom coming in all different shapes and sizes. And there's a lot of Romaria species out there. And it takes a lot of work to really be able to identify uh, Romaria. So I don't know exactly which species this is. Often you have to use microscopy and look under a microscope. But what I love about showing this is, this is a mushroom that you get kind of yellows and tans. It's not that interesting. But the minute you incorporate it with iron, you get these beautiful shades of purple. And this scarf that I'm wearing today is dyed in Romaria fungi. We can go to the next screen. And this is one of my all-time favorites. This mushroom is a blue chanterelle. And the type of mushroom it is, is a false gill mushroom. And we all know a very famous edible that's a false gill edible is the chanterelle, the yellow chanterelle. But this is just the flower of the forest floor. It is just stunning. And I mean, I spend hours just gazing at this uh, laying on the forest floor. They're just so gorgeous and they just are easy to use in the dye pot and they make a beautiful color. They are edible. They're a little more woody than I prefer. And because of their beauty in the dye pot and the pigments they make, I prefer not to eat them, but they are an edible dye mushroom. We can go to the next screen. Let's see. All right, and so now we're getting into that mushroom type that's the gilled mushroom. It's kind of the classic little mushroom that we think about. Uh, this is a Cortinarius neosanguinus and it makes these beautiful reds. Um, Cortinarius is a huge species of, of mushrooms and so big that they divide it into subspecies. And it's the um, Dermosibi family that provides the dye color within the quaternaries. So there's a lot of quaternaries out there, but not all of them create dyes. Um, but 
there are within the Dermosity family, and I'll show you a couple others. There's a whole range of them, but this just happens to be, you know, the king of all with this beautiful red. So we can go to the next screen. I'm getting used to presenting saying going to the next screen. Thanks for bearing with me. I apologize. Um, this is a polypore mushroom. And polypore is another type of mushroom and they have pores underneath them. And this is the famous Faola schwetzenitzi, the Dyer's polypore. And this mushroom is amazing. The colorways that you can get here with the greens, the orange, the yellow, I'm not even showing on this screen the other colorways you can get with the golden um, browns and rusts. And it's just spectacular. And it is a super easy mushroom. It's the beginner mushroom. You start with this mushroom and um, you can really learn from that. And we'll go now to the next slide. Um, another type of mushroom that's out there are puffballs. And there's lots of puffballs out there. They're edible. This is Pisolithus tinctorius. This is not edible, so don't eat it. But just look at that color in the specimen. I mean, it is spectacular. And it creates a beautiful range of golden browns that are just really rich and beautiful. We can go to the next screen. And now we get to my favorite. Uh, type of mushroom. It's the tooth fungi. And these are more complex to work with in the dye pot uh, because you have to spend time really shifting their pH to a higher alkaline and kind of babysitting them. But wow, they create gorgeous colors. And because they like a high alkaline dye bath, they dye cellulose fibers beautifully. And they're just these florets that are just, just gorgeous and stunning and some of my favorite. Okay, we can go to the next screen. And I think that, great. So we can stop sharing and I'm gonna spotlight, hopefully it works. Uh, Lucy's gonna spotlight my overhead camera here. And I am going to shift to that because I have some of these mushrooms here along with the swatches from the Mushroom Color Atlas that I wanted to show you guys. Um, this is a Conodontium tinctorium. And you can see this amazing, web of white gorgeousness. And for those that know, that is the mycelium. It's this beautiful web. And it grow in this case, it's growing up through the mushrooms. And you can see in this Econodontium that there are, uh, these have teeth. It's very woody, but there's teeth there. And it's just beautiful. And you can see the colors that it's creating on the fabric itself across the wools and the silks and the linens, if I can get those thumb through. And then the colors, when you actually turn it into pigment and how different that is as a pigment versus a dye and the colors are so unique. This is Hidnellum cerellium. This is uh, the mushroom that I showed you. Now, when I harvested this, this was much bigger. I've let it dry and it shrunk down because a majority of uh, mushroom is actually water and weight, but you can see the little teeth there. You can even see the blue color on those teeth. And here are the colors um, from the dyes with this mushroom across these fibers. They're just gorgeous here. And then again, making it a pigment, it becomes kind of a greenish color with hints of uh, yellows and browns in them. So very different. And then here is a dried uh, pisolithus, that puff ball. If you look closely, you can see color in it. It's not as vibrant as a photograph because it's dried. But here are some of these gorgeous colors that it produces. It's just amazing. So I really, this fungus is lovely. And it makes beautiful ink. It doesn't really make pigment, and I'll talk about that in a second, but the ink is just spectacular. And here we have a rather large Cortinarius neosanguinus with its little baby here. This is usually more the size that you find them. This was a whopper. I did a happy dance when I came across that. And then again, the colors from it on the fibers and the ranges of these deep purples and reds. They're just stunning. And then this, when it becomes pigment, is actually very similar here. So starting to understand the science and the chemical compounds of these mushrooms and what it's doing and how you can work with that is really exciting. Now, here's another uh, Cortinarius. 
Um, this, this is subcrocifolius, it, it broke. Um, I'm showing this because you can see how orange this is in comparison to this red mushroom. You can see that there. And the reason I wanted to show this is because this is a Cortinarius that produces beautiful orange colors and that range of, of orange to beige. And then when it becomes a pigment with different modifiers, it is kind of that orangish color, but then also the reds come through. So depending on how you modify that, this is a whopper of a specimen. This is Hidnellum regium, one of my favorite. It's another tooth fungus. You can see the teeth under there in this beautiful color. And it just, the story behind finding this is lovely and beautiful with a mycologist friend, Michael Bug. And uh, we, it had been told to us that this mushroom did not grow in our area, but lo and behold, we found it. And these are the colors. And these are just colors after my own heart. And then it makes beautiful pigments that are just stunning. Um, and then here we've got another tooth fungi because I just love these guys. This is Hidnellum suaviolum. It's just these beautiful specimens, you know, and they are a lot bigger when I'm harvesting them, but as I dry them and here you can see all the little ones coming up around that. And these colors, again, like the Hidnellum uh, cerulean, the suaviolans, these blues, and greens across all these. And then the pigment, you know, there is that same change where it becomes a little more brown. It's got some greens and some yellows in it, um, but beautiful. Here's a mushroom we didn't talk about. This is the lobster mushroom. Uh, this is a very small little uh, lobster, um, but it creates beautiful um, pinks and kind of cranberry reds. And that mushroom is a really unique mushroom because it's actually a russula that gets um, parasitized by the hypomyces. And it's that uh, relationship that creates the, the pigment for the dye. So here you can see these colors. They're, look at that difference. It didn't do anything on linen, but on wool and silk, you've got this beautiful range. So again, doing these documentation and experimentation to learn what works well across different fibers. And then the pigment is just beautiful. So, and then finally, last but not least, our Dyer's polypore, Phaolus. Um, this is a beautiful specimen harvested at the right time in its life. Uh, mushrooms look really different. Uh, when they're young versus middle-aged versus older, kind of like us humans. And uh, you can see here the pores underneath, the color, all the color in this mushroom. And again, the color range is great. This is just one study. Um, if I make it more acidic, I can get these golden rusts and browns, but even some interesting colors on linen. And then the pigment is a beautiful pigment to work with, these kind of yellow, greeny browns. So we can unspotlight that and go back to sharing that file. Um, again, thanks everyone for bearing with the fact that my presentation didn't work. Um, so now we're gonna talk about the process of actually uh, creating these mushrooms. So the dye mushrooms themselves. Um, I'm foraging for these, these are all wild and um, you know, I have some feelings about ethical foraging, and uh, they're my feelings. It's my perspective and my point of view, because the mushroom is the fruit of the fungus. So when you think about that fruit, you think about an apple tree, right? The, the fungi is the tree itself, and the apple is the mushroom. You can go pick off every apple from every apple tree, and it's totally fine. You can do the same thing with the mushrooms. However, all the different types of mushrooms I talked about, they, they have the mycelium there, the roots, so that stays intact underground, but they all have ways to disperse spores. And the spores are the seed, and you want these mushrooms to be able to di disperse their spores so that they'll come back. Now, they may not come back every year. It depends on the habitat and the climate and the environment. Um, but I always like to leave 
mushrooms behind. So when you think about maybe harvesting some wildflowers for your dye pot, you know, you're leaving mush or flowers behind. And I like to leave mushrooms behind. Um, I just think it's a great way to uh, consider the habitat and the environment and these specimens. Um, when I bring my mushrooms home, I actually dehydrate them. I prepare them all. I dehydrate them and I store them dry. Now you don't need to do that. You can store them in your freezer. I just don't happen to have room in my freezer for them. Um, but I work with them dried and I'm a little persnickety and you don't have to do this, but I grind all my mushrooms in a coffee grinder. And you may think that's totally crazy, but I have found the more surface exposure I can get from the mushroom, the more potential I can pull out that pigment. And because these take a while to find, you know, for the Cortinarius neosanguinus, I, it was three years before I had found enough to really uh, dye something substantial. So it takes time. And I really want to get every bit of color I can out of it. But you don't have to do that. You can break them into small pieces and put them in your dye pot. And that's totally fine. Um, one question that comes up a lot, and it's true for all natural dyes, is, well, how much do I need? You know, how many mushrooms do I need to be able to dye some fiber? And we follow a general rule of thumb that you do in all natural dyes, which is you think about the weight of the goods, and the goods are the mushroom, and the weight of the fiber and you know the yarn that you want to dye or the fabric or whatever it may be and if i've got 10 grams of fiber i'm going to need 10 grams of mushrooms and that's a one to one ratio and that's a great starting point if you want to explore mushroom dyes as you get into it though you're going to learn nuances and you can consult the mushroom color atlas and you'll learn that you know for faolus you need half the amount of mushroom to fiber. So you only need five grams of faolus mushroom for 10 grams of fiber. So you can start to kind of, you know, be more precise about that. But that's really um, a great way to start is kind of the one-to-one -one rule of thumb. We'll go to the next screen. Um, I use natural fibers. Um, for my dyeing. I'm working with wool and silk and cellulose, like in the case of the mushroom color atlas linen, but I'm also working with hemp fibers and bamboo and everything. And those natural fibers, if we go to the next screen, they need to be cleaned. And um, we call that scouring. Um, basically, we want to make sure that we're cleaning these fibers. And we're not leaving any remnants from the process, the manufacturing process or whatever it may be, so that these fibers are clean and can accept the dye. And that gets us into mordantine on the next screen. Um, mordantine is a term, if we can go up maybe a couple more, uh, that's going backwards. There we go. All right, so mordantine, um, is something that we need to do to our natural fibers to create this bond with the dye. And um, Morden is a French term that means to bind or to bite. And uh, it's a way of using uh, minerals and uh, mineral salts and things to pre-treat your fibers so that the dye will bind to it. Um, the simplest way to get started is to use aluminum potassium sulfate, alum, as your mordant. This is something you could buy in a grocery store. And it's a very simple process of just heating up the water, putting the fibers in and putting the mordant and letting it kind of sit for an hour so that that uh, mineral binds to the fiber. Um, however, mordantine is an art in and of itself that I totally love learning all about the science behind it. You can use different things for mordants. And as you use different mordants, you're going to shift the coloration. And that's how I was able to get a variety of colors. Not only was I using different types of fibers that were gonna respond differently, I was using different mordants. And from that, you can create this range of colors. Um, and now if we go to the actual next screen, dyeing the mushrooms. So for the mushroom color atlas, I'm dyeing these three inch swatches. And for everyone, I've got nine. And so I'm working in jars and I've set up kind of a makeshift uh, canning situation where I'm just putting them in a water bath. Um, 
Now I talked about how I grind my mushrooms. So I put my mushrooms in there and I cook them down. Um, I am very uh, particular about temperature too. And again, I have some quirks of things that I'm, you know, picky about, but you don't need to be at all. Um, however, I've learned over time that if I let my dye pots get too hot and get to a boil, I can sometimes zap the color or brown it out. So with the dye mushrooms, I'm always very sensitive to temperature because gone to a lot of effort to get these. I don't want to brown them out. So I tend to keep my temperatures between 140 and 160. However, like all things in natural dyes, you know, certain things don't want any heat like Cortinarius neosanguinus to get the red. It has the same or similar, I shouldn't say same because I'm not a scientist, uh, chemical compound as matter. Um, so you're gonna adapt differently based on the mushroom. Um, but keeping an eye on your heat is great. And then I strain out my mushrooms. Um, that's because I grind mine. I don't want to pick little grounds out of everything. Um, but you don't have to do that. You can leave your mushrooms in with your fiber and cook them down. Um, another reason why I strain mine is I don't want to pick the stuff out, but I will then recook those mushrooms and make another dye bath and put fiber in, and that's called an exhaust bath. And I'm doing that because I wanna get every little last bit of color I can from these mushrooms. Um, so let's go to the next screen. Um, this is making lakes. And everyone, it's always like a lake. What are you making a lake? This is another French term. It comes from lac because they were working with the insect lac to get colors and they were experimenting around and they learned that they could take this through a pigmentation or through a process to get pigment from it. And that became known as lake, laking or lakes. Um, to make a lake is really, really simple. You've got your dye bath, um, it's soluble, you know, it's a water bath, it's kind of like brewing a cup of tea, although don't drink the mushroom dye bath. Um, and you've got that dye bath, and now you want to actually capture the pigment and make that soluble dye an insoluble pigment. And we do that by adding alum and soda ash, and that uh, basically captures all the pigment modules. They all glob onto each other, and they sink to the bottom. And then we can strain that off, and we now have pigment that we can use to make paint. So if we go to the next screen real quick, um, you can see, oop, skipped one. There we go, uh, mushroom paint. So for the Mushroom Color Atlas, I made watercolor paint with all my pigments using gum arabic, um, but you can use any type of binder. You can use gum tragacanth to go on fabric. You can use soy, you can use egg to make tempera, you can, um, use milk to make casein. You can even make oil paint with resins. You know, the sky's the limit once you've transformed that into a pigment. You now have all the opportunities to create this paint. People will make pastels, they'll make crayons, all sorts of wonderful things. Um, so we'll go here to the next screen as I finish up my presentation. Thanks everyone for bearing with the fact that my thing didn't work. Um, when I think about the future of the Mushroom Color Atlas, I am continually adding mushrooms. I have seven mushrooms on my table to add in to the mix um, and traveling around and foraging in different areas and connecting and collaborating with my community of mycologists and mycophiles and artists and creators and makers um, so that we can open this up to the community. My dream is someday that the Mushroom Color Atlas, everyone can load in their colors um, that they've created and we can experience this much larger atlas of color. Um, other things that, you know, I'm thinking about is, you know, we've got companies like Mycoworks that are making uh, leather out of mycelium, you know, just incredible amount of opportunities there. Um, designers like Christine Bolin, who was inspired by the Mushroom Color Atlas to create these palettes that informed her fashion designs. And then recently I had a team of color designers from Nike who were thinking about new ways to incorporate color into the work that they're doing and had them out 
to forage for dye mushrooms and then come into the studio and make um, dyes with those and so forth. So I really think the opportunity is boundless and, uh, you know, uh, getting into the science and really having mycologists study the science of these pigments and getting that information published for people. And then wouldn't it be amazing if we cultivated dye mushrooms the way we do edible and medicinal and the impact that it could have um, in the, you know, slow fashion and bringing these kinds of dyes to that world. So the last screen, I'm going to put a plug in for the International Fungi and Fiber Symposium. This is what Miriam started back in 1980. It continues to this day of people coming from all over the world. And we are super lucky. It's going to be in Washington State. For those of you that are uh, in the Pacific Northwest, um, my friend Alyssa Allen and Micah Works is heading this up and bringing this to life. And so if you this, if this has piqued your curiosity, you would be welcome to join us on this week-long conference as we continue to uh, share all of our research and understanding of mushroom dyes to ensure that it gets continued down to the uh, continue to be passed down to the next generation. So finally, the last screen of thank you to uh, SDA for the invitation to present for all of you for joining and for SAQA for hosting this. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Julie. <clears throat> That's wonderful. I can't, your, your um, enthusiasm is contagious. Oh, thank you. Your knowledge I hope it made up for the fact <laughs> that there, my presentation was, didn't work. <laughs> it's great. No, that's no problem. We have um, a lot of questions. And so we okay. might run a little bit over today. Um, for folks in the audience, if you need to leave right on the hour, this, um, as a reminder, this is recorded and it'll be available uh, next week to, to view if you need to leave early, but we'll try to get as many questions um, to as many questions as we can. Um, right off the bat, uh, we did have a number of people um, wondering if the uh, Atlas um, is really, is it focused on um, fungi from, from this specific region, from where we are, or is it across the U.S.? So the majority of the fungi is growing in my area, but it also grows all throughout uh, other areas of the United States and the rest of the world. Um, you know, I've had people writing in from Texas who were finding tooth fungi, and I thought, I had no idea that Texas had a habitat or environment for these. So these mushrooms do grow lots of other places, and um, one thing that I'm looking forward to do is traveling to different areas, collecting those specimens and getting them added in to the atlas. Wonderful. Um, so you're continuing to add to the atlas. It's, it's ongoing. Yep. Awesome. Yes, I have seven mushrooms right here that are all dyed. And pigments are made and I need to scan them and get them uploaded. Oh, that's um, exciting. So yeah. yeah. Um, we did have uh, quite a few questions. Um, Mandy and Julie both uh, asked about sort of the ethics of foraging. Julie, um, is in Australia and she, she noted that uh, collecting plants on public, public parks and, and lands is um, uh, you need a permit to do yeah. that. Is that yeah. similar here? Or in most places? It is, anyway? it is. And in the mushroom color atlas, I have a whole little area about ethical foraging in the process section. And you do need to make sure that if you are in areas that require permits, that you get the right kind of permitting, that you are not collecting, you know, in areas where you shouldn't be on private property or in areas that are preserves or conservation sites. So you really need to do your homework and you really need to make sure, you know, there are mushrooms that are on the red list that are very rare and very threatened. And so you don't wanna just go out and start picking everything because you're in essence destroying that environment and that habitat. And so if you do some research, there's a lot of great uh, resources and field guides out there. There's lots of mycological societies, you know, all throughout the world that you can join. And you just learn the basics and start with one or two mushrooms, start to understand those. A lot of people enter in through learning about edible mushrooms first. Um, that they're interested in cooking up. So definitely do be an ethical forager. Um, even if you come across a big patch of something, you don't need to pick 
every last one, leave them, leave them for someone else. There's plenty to make the world go around. And I think having that kind of karma in the forest, it really, it comes back um, in ways that we don't even know. So. That's great. Thanks, Julie. Um, a couple questions about, um, do, do you wear gloves or um, when you're foraging, do you need to be concerned about um, certain uh, fungi and, and, and yeah. inhaling them, that sort of thing? Are there precautions to take there? Yeah. So, uh, you know, there are a lot of fungi out there that you don't want to ingest. Uh, they may not kill you, but they might make you really sick. So you do want to be very conscientious. I don't wear gloves unless it's cold. Um, but when I'm working with the mushrooms, I am sure, you know, I'm making sure that I'm not, you know, picking a big clump and cutting it all up and then licking my lips and things like that and my fingers and all this stuff. So you do want to be conscientious of that. Um, th there are uh, mushrooms that, I guess I was going to tell a funny story, but I don't, I don't know. It might take too long. So I'm just always very conscientious. I'm keeping them separate from any edibles I'm finding. So I always have a separate bag for my edibles. I never have my dye mushrooms in with those. You want to make sure you separate everything out and know exactly what it is. And then the, the dye mushrooms, they're staying in the garage. They never even come in the house. Um, so you're making sure you're not mixing those up. Um, but I would encourage you to really, you know, do some research and learning before you just go out and start picking. Um, but yeah, unless you're fully ingesting the mushroom down into your system, you're going to be okay. Now, when I do grind my mushrooms in the studio and I'm working with them, I am wearing a mask. I wore masks well before COVID um, because I just don't want to have you know, all that kind of inhaled into my sinuses and stuff. And then you do want to be smart about how you're disposing of your mushrooms on your property. Um, Phaeolus is a white rot and it can actually um, kill trees. So you don't want to necessarily dump it right next to your favorite tree or something like that. So good information. Thank you. Um, a couple of questions about a clarification, your one-to-one -one ratio uh, is that um, dried mushrooms, the weight of that? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, and that's a great point. Um, I talk about working with fresh mushrooms on the Mushroom Color Atlas. I do work with fresh mushrooms, and a lot of people work with frozen, frozen mushrooms. But those mushrooms have a lot of water content in them. So one of the kind of tricks is I, I put a pile of mushrooms together. I pile them all up, and then I look at my pile of fiber and I kind of eyeball it. And if it's like, I got way more fiber than I have mushrooms, I'm probably going to get a weaker color. But if I have a pile of fiber that's about the size of my mushrooms, I'm probably going to be okay. So you can definitely eyeball it and you don't have to measure things out. And sometimes I'll have a whole bunch of fresh mushrooms and I make a big dye bath and I know what I'm putting in isn't enough to soak it all up, but it's fine because I keep that dye bath. I store them and I just am always dipping back into it. So you can keep these and store them. Um, they might get a little mold on them. Well, they will get moldy if you leave the mushrooms in there. Um, but if you strain the mushrooms out, they still might get a little mold on them. And if you put some cloves or some clove oil, that's an antimicrobial, that'll keep some of the mold off. If you do get a little mold, it's it's not the end of the world. I like to store mine in airtight containers uh, for the mold, but also for the odor. <laughs> <laughs> um, we had a couple of questions um, really kind of um, honing in on place. One person asked if, um, if you know of any changes that occurred to the mushrooms based on um, when Mount St. Helens erupted and the ash in the soil, did that affect things? Yeah, it did. And, you know, what's interesting is as a kid, I went to Mount St. Helens until she erupted and I've gone back as an adult. And it's a very different environment and habitat. A lot of the mushrooms were wiped out and different mushrooms have started to come back in different areas. It's kind of like, uh, you know, the 
the mycelium and everything is there for the plants. So you'd have the, the lupin that fixed the nitrogen and the fungi, and then they would start to fruit over time. So they have come uh, back over time, but they're different. And some of the ones that were there before still aren't there. And I'm gonna give a talk for the Mount St. Helens Institute um, on March 28th, and we'll kind of get into some things unique to, to Mount St. Helens if people wanna join that talk. Oh, very cool, is that online? Will it that is, be on your yeah. website? Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, so check Julie's website for the details on that if you're interested, folks. Um, and we had another question just in general. You know, there's so many variables um, once you get get the uh, mushrooms into into the studio. Um, but do you notice um, variation depending on location and and of where you're picking the mushrooms from? Have you witnessed that? Um, Yep, yep. Uh, and the habitat can inform it and, you know, the level of moisture and the, the relationship with the trees, different trees that they're growing with, you know, um, Pisolithus will grow, has a mycorrhizal relationship with a variety of different types of trees. And even though it's the exact same mushroom, I'll see different results based on if I pull it from a drier climate mm. versus a slightly wetter. And they're not significant, but you can see them. And that's what's so amazing is that they all kind of have this imprint that as you coax this color out, that's unique and, and different. So yeah, you can see that. And I'm super excited to get to Texas and see what the tooth fungi down there are doing uh, compared to the tooth fungi I have here. Okay, we have just a few more questions that I wanna ask because okay. I'm curious about them. <laughs> sure. um, are there any molds you can use for dyeing? Someone asked. You know, I don't know a lot about that, but what I do know is that there are some scientific papers and research that I've read where they're using, um, they're creating like bacteria and molds in labs that they're using for color. So I do know that that sort of thing is happening, but I don't know much about it because I, I really love digging into the science and this is when I wished I became, a, you know, a biologist <laughs> or a chemist. <laughs> in all your spare time. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, and then what about lichens? Are you, have you um, experimented oh. with them as yet? Yes. I have um, experimented with lichens. That is not my specialty and expertise. Uh, lichens can produce a wide range of colors. And in fact, Alyssa Allen is really kind of a resident expert on that along with Judith McKenzie have a long history of working with lichens and lichen dyes. And there's a lot of, you know, discussion around the ethical foraging for lichens, but I have dyed with lichens in my uh, local community. And yes, you can get lots of great colors from them. That's great. We had um, a ton of questions sort of about the uh, dyeing process, about the sort of fugitive nature of, um, <laughs> of the dyes and the mordants and um, and the different um, fibers that you're using. And I think you cover that pretty well um, on your website, right? Mm -hmm. Okay, so yeah, I, would I do folks. Yeah, there. and my hope is to add like fast studies okay. um, to the atlas over time. And, you know, there are some mushrooms that are tried and true light fast and they're great just the way there's some natural dyes are. Um, and then there's others that may shift color over time or fade. So it's it's a whole range, just like you get into natural dyes. And a lot of these um, chemical compounds and pigments are the same. So, you know, I'm really curious about a mushroom called Hidnellum fusco indicus. When you dye with that and you work with it the way you work with indigo and you kind of ferment it, it is like indigo. And I wanna figure out and learn more about that. Um, and then uh, the Cortinarius neosanguinis is similar to matter, has the same chemical compounds and stuff, so. Fascinating. Well, with that, you know, the last question, would you, um, and I yeah. think this is a nice way to end, um, can you read that quote um, from Ursula Le Guin again as we close out? We had a lot of people wanting to hear that again. Yes, let me <laughs> make sure I read it correctly, okay. To use the world well, to be able to stop wasting it and our time in it, we need to relearn our being in it. I love that. And what a great way yeah. to end the talk today. Thank um, you so much, everyone. 
Thank you so and, uh, much, Julie. What a gift. Um, thank you. And oh, thanks for your patience with my presentation. <laughs> I got to figure out why all of a sudden it wouldn't work it, when it worked all those other it times. It was <laughs> wonderful and it was worth um, waiting to get it figured out. And I do encourage everybody to check out Julie's um, uh, Mushroom Color Atlas website and, you know, give yourself some time to explore. There's lots of fun stuff to see. Um, and if you're interested a little bit more, we also have a blog article. Um, if you go to surfacedesign.org, um, you can click the blog and see a blog article that um, Julie did uh, in January, I think, right? Yep. Um, a couple yep. months ago. Thank you again, Julie. And thank you to our sponsors uh, who made today's talk possible. Moda, Fiber, Fa Moda Fabrics and Supplies, Quilting Daily, Treville Family, eQuilter.com, Orophil, Artistic Artifacts, Clover, Empty Spools Seminar, Misty Fuse, Nine Patch Fabrics, Quilt Mania, Schiffer Publishing, Thai Silks, and TheQuiltShow.com. Um, again, you can check out Julie's website um, and uh, read our blog article on the surfacedesign.org blog. Um, if you enjoyed today's talk, please consider making a contribution to SDA as a small nonprofit. Every little gift enables us to organize programming like today's talk with Julie. The recording will be available um, on YouTube next week, so keep your eyes peeled for that. And next Wednesday's talk features Judith Content, um, Ephemeral Land Art, sponsored by Sakwa. And Judith is also an SDA member. It's going to be another great talk. Thank you all. Enjoy the afternoon and we'll see you next week. Thank you.